He's a high volume thrower. If you allow him time to throw the football, he's going to gash you. So it is very important for the Eagles to get a significant pass rush and make him not not necessarily sack him, but make him speed up, make him throw the football uh, before he wants to throw the football. McMullen and Jody McDonald, your Mac and Mac Birds 365 guys here as we lead up to an Eagle Monday night affair against the Vikings down at uh, Lincoln Financial Field. Um, should be a good one. I think it's going to be a competitive game. Uh, it should be fun. Should hang in the balance. John McMullen not sneaking out early because it's a blowout. No, no, no. This one could very well go down to the wire like last week uh, game against the Lions did. Uh, Johnny Mac, two more trends heading into tonight game. They kind of go in conflict with each other. So I'm going to ask you which you believe is more on point tonight. Kirk Cousins, nine career starts against the Philadelphia Eagles is six and three. Some with the commanders slash football team slash Redskins. Um, he won some games with Washington and is also one as the quarterback of the Vikings. Six and three lifetime against the Eagles. However, Kirk Monday Cousins, night, you give me Monday night, Kirk Cousins, yeah. prime time, not so good. Below five, well, below, I think he's eight and six. They lied, uh, I think he's two and nine on Monday night, right. And he had lost his first nine. He actually won his last two Monday nights. So he's trending in the right direction there. But he's beaten two bad bear teams both the last two times he's played on Monday night. He has not been a good primetime quarterback, whether it's Monday, Sunday, and or Thursday night. Which stat is more prevalent tonight? The fact that Kirk Cousins has had success against the Eagles or that Kirk Cousins seems to be a little choker? when he's under the league lights of primetime football? Yeah, it's a good question. It's kind of been a self-fulfilling prophecy. A lot of, you know, I can't talk. Early in his career, I think he was just bad on Monday night. Uh, recently, it's been a, you know, the Vikings offense has been really good. The defense has been really bad. You mentioned the two wins over bad Chicago teams. I remember he had a couple losses at least one loss against a good Chicago defense that was, wasn't his fault. Let's put it that way. Um, so it kind of works both ways. You know, we always put too much on the quarterback, but I do think it kind of sneaks in your back of your mind when you have a lack of success uh, and, and he hears about it constantly. Um, our buddy, Paul Dama, which I, you know, I've been talking about this since we started this show. He's, he's, he might be the toughest guy in the NFL to um, judge as a quarterback. His numbers are so good. I mean, they're they're absurd. Uh, and for a long, consistent period of time, but then you use the eye test, and I know analytics people um, hate the eye test, and he said, well, you know, he's just not that good. Uh, but Damo, uh, our buddy Paul Damo, which put up his stats package this week and check it out at jacobsports.com. He's got some, you know, cousin statistics that, you know, open your eyes. Since he, since he became a full-time starter in 2015, he has a 101 passer rating. 101 pass, even in this era, that's good. Over that time frame, plus – 135 when it comes to touchdowns interception ratio plus 135 67.8 completion percentage 7.8 yards per attempt that means he gets the football down the field as well 1.2 interception percentage Second best in the entire NFL behind only Aaron Rodgers, who doesn't throw interceptions. He's at 0 0.8. 0 0.8 to 1.2. This is the weirdest quarterback maybe in the history of football. He can kill you, and he also has never had – he's got great statistical ses, success, but he's never had great team success. Right. If you got an explanation for it, 
I'd like to hear it because Here's I don't the analytic have it. that uh, wills out over all others for me. For his entire career, he's 60 and 59. Games that he started, his team started, they've had good defenses, they've had bad defenses. He's had massive Mostly bad. Mostly bad. That's my point. Mostly bad. Minnesota had a good defense before he got there. And when they got there, they kind of fell apart. Now they weren't. Do you think they maybe really, that's in part because they had to blatantly overpay Kirk Cousins because of those gaudy numbers part, that Paul Domwich just put out there. He gets certainly paid part of as it. if he's supposed to be that good. Uh, that's certainly uh, part of it. It's ironic that you know when the when when the Vikings made the championship game and lost to the Eagles, which obviously everybody remembers. Um, Case Keenum was the quarterback. Right, that wasn't Kirk Cousins. No. Um, and you're right. They had the great defense. They came in. They were the number one ranked defense in the NFL that year, even though they got waxed here in Philadelphia. Um, and you're right. I mean, that happens. We saw it in Seattle. Seattle was winning Super Bowl, should have won a second one. Uh, we're a yard away if Russell doesn't make the big mistake. But either or, really good team. And then when they had to pay Russell, all of a sudden the defense starts to slip. So this is what we're going to be in next year. Yeah, It's great to pay Jalen Hurts $2 million for his production. That's phenomenal. But if you got to pay him, you're already complaining about the defense, most Eagles fans. Well, imagine if you got to pay a quarterback, Kirk Cousins money. What happens then? Well, they get one more year on a less expensive deal. He'll be on the fourth year of his contract. They'll renew it. They'll spread some money around. So he's going to make more, but he's not going to be into that count 30 plus million against the cap range next year. So these next two years are going to be pretty damn important for the Eagles if they want to go back to another Super Bowl. Yeah. And then getting back to your original point with, with Kirk, I, I don't, he's a really good, and I described this. So I, I've come to that. He's just a really good thrower of the, of the football. He's a really good uh, um, passer. He's a high volume thrower. If you allow him time to throw the football, he's going to gash you. So it is very important for the Eagles to get a significant pass rush and make him, not not necessarily sack him, but make him speed up, make him throw the football uh, before he wants to throw the football. Because if he gets his feet set and he can throw from the pocket, a clean pocket, he's gonna he's gonna complete passes. Simple do you have faith that. the Eagles are gonna be able to do that tonight? Do you see a much improved pass rush out of the Eagles against the Vikings? I think it'll be better than last week. I don't think they're gonna do much against the Vikings tackles. Um Brian O'Neill is, you know, Nick Sirianni said again on Saturday that Lane Johnson is the best right tackle in the world, and he thinks nobody else is particularly close. I kind of agree with that. But Brian O'Neill's in the conversation for number two. That's how good he is. Um, Christian Darris also a lot like Panay Sewell. Um, very young player, but really talented. I mean, really talented, and he looks like he's going to be a star player for a long time. Inside, though, I keep talking about Garrett Bradbury, man. you got to take advantage of Garrett Bradbury. He might be the worst center, worst starting center in football. Um, he can't block. Now, he's okay as a run blocker because he's very athletic. Everybody said, hey, he's the next Jason Kelsey. And he is, from that standpoint, tremendously athletic. <clears throat> but he can't anchor anybody. I mean, I talked about H Akeem Hicks. Akeem Hicks throws him around like a rag doll when he would play him. Um, Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargrave, Jordan Davis, they got to take advantage of, of Garrett Bradbury. All right, week one, Lions did what they did against the Eagles. They ran the ball very effectively. Um, made DeAndre Swift look like a, a Pro Bowl running back. We all know the Eagles didn't tackle well. Well, they missed tackles across all three levels. Defensive tackle, linebacker, and safety. Which concerns you the most coming into tonight? If there's going to be a repeat that there isn't an upgrade and a better performance out of either the D-line, the linebackers, and or the back four, 
uh, which one scares you most coming into tonight's game because the Dalvin Cook guy could uh, yeah, absolutely reproduce yeah. what Swift did last week. He, um, yeah, he he's really good, uh, Dalvin Cook, and he can beat you multiple ways. He can he's explosive. He's much more explosive than DeAndre Swift <clears throat> when it comes to sort of home runs and things like that. But he also is a physical runner, really physical runner. So he goes between the tackles as well. Um, I, I'm concerned. That I've said it on the show. I'm, and I said it last week. I'm concerned with Kaiser White and Chauncey Gardner Johnson and run support. Um, those are the two guys I'm most concerned with. So it's combination, uh, second level, third level. Um, I don't know if those guys can hold up and run support. And I got to see it. And this is not the back those guys are going to be able to take on in the open field and bring down. Now, you're not always going to see that type of back. Um, so, but the Eagles also know, and this is where I talk about people don't pay enough attention to situations. So the Eagles know how bad they were against the run, and they know they're facing a better running back. So for a lack of a better term, they're going to overcorrect and they might have heavier boxes. They might, they might add, they might put more to support of the run than they probably should to try to corral depth. So I think it's going to look better, but I think they're going to have to give more effort to do it. So that leaves you susceptible to Jefferson and Thielen and Osborne. Probably not Riker, but um, so we'll see how it shakes out. It's sort of a give and take. I think they're going to overcorrect, overcorrect uh, when it comes to stopping the run. Well, one thing I would suggest won't be an overcorrection would be more than 22 snaps for Jordan Davis. Uh, that, that That's a suggestion, Coach Gannon. If you're listening, yeah, I would get him on the field. For well, that's part of the time. overcorrection. I think he's going to be on the field more. I think they know they have to stop the run. I think you're going to see more uh, five-man fronts, um, and we'll see. And and we'll, then Slay's got to hold up, which he can. We know that. But Bradbury's got to hold up. Uh, um, Maddox has got to hold up. And more importantly, Epps and, and, and C.J. Gardner-Johnson got to, got to hold up. Can the Eagles stop the Vikings run tonight? It's going to be one of the key aspects of the game. A guy who will be calling it, En Espanol, on Eagles uh, Spanish Radio Network, is going to join us next. The voice of the Eagles in Spanish, Ricky Ricardo, up next here on Birds 365.